enjoying the talks. So uh, I'm going to be talking about how you sense the world around you uh, using something called Internet of Things. So probably unlike uh, some of the other talks that uh, you've seen before, this one involves uh, hardware. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, you know, I have uh, my bachelor's in computer systems engineering as well as a, a PhD in uh, wireless sensor networks. Uh, right here from UQ. Spent about 10 years in this place. Um, I currently lecture at UQ in the School of ITE, so I lecture the third year and fourth year embedded systems, or some of my students like to say I torture them, uh, but uh, uh, we get to do some interesting things. I also work a little bit with CSIRO, and uh, over the past uh, 10 to 15 years I've been involved uh, with uh, various startups, about five or so uh, startups that I can think of. Uh, and just from my experience, startups are are great when you're young and you're, you graduated and you want to be an engineer and uh, you don't know the value of money, also the value of sleep. Uh, you know, startups uh, are good to do and they can be fun and really challenging as well as uh, really character building uh, as well. And so, and of course, I dabble into my, my uh, research uh, interests, embedded systems, wireless sensors networks, biomedical systems, how about physical systems? So some of those topics uh, you'd like to see in this talk today. All right, so let's get to it. So I'm going to introduce something called the Internet of Things. So hopefully most of you have heard of uh, the Internet of Things. What does it mean? Okay, it effectively means to connect the real world or the physical world uh, to the digital world, the digital domain. All right, so you can get everyday objects, you know, coffee cups and so on. Sensors in a place like this, lights and so on, they can communicate, they can process data. You know, how can you harness all that capability and uh, use it to, to do some good? Okay, and those types of systems are known as cyber physical systems. All right, and they're really a core building block of what we call the Internet of Things. So you can see here the graph, uh, the graphic here on this side here, the Internet of Things. So this one here is showing from 2003 got the Earth's population versus uh, the number of uh, devices, so number of internet connected devices. So you can see here 2003, there's more people than internet uh, connected devices. At the beginning of the 2000s, you can see a little bit later, 2010, now there is more internet connected devices than people. And you can see it starts to increase and of course by 2020 it's predicted to be about 50 billion, 50 billion internet devices uh, compared to uh, the Earth's population. So obviously by 2020, we expect you know, Skynet to be fully active by then. All right. So I guess one of the, the quotes of why all this is occurring and how uh, we can take advantage of this, and this is a, a quote which I picked up from Eric Schmidt, uh, Google now Alphabet executive chair. Okay, and he said at uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, the internet is disappearing. And you can see that in the types of devices that uh, you're getting today. A few years ago, you know, to access the internet, you'd, you'd get your phone, uh, you get your tablet, now you can get your watch, uh, and so on. You know, it will become, you know, your toothbrush, your shoe, and so on. They will all become connected to the internet. So the internet is, in that sense, it's not going away, but it's disappearing. It's, it's moving away from that traditional model, of where you go to a computer and you access the internet. Okay, it's becoming more ubiquitous, so it's disappearing. All right, and to facilitate that and to use it, of course, we have to use something called the Internet of Things. So just where you see uh, how everything fits, you know, we've had talks about cloud computing, it's only the interesting and, and wonderful stuff you can do with, with those sorts of technologies. Where this sort of fits is sort of this sort of model here. So you start off uh, what we call the sort of the ground level. So you've got your internet capable devices, your phones, uh, your embedded platforms that can all uh, communicate uh, by the internet. Okay, this is sort of a, a new layer that's just come out, proposed by Cisco, known as the fog computing layer. So you've got the fog, you know, fog being very close to the ground. So I'm providing services and so on specifically for internet of things type uh, devices. And then of course that communicates to the cloud. Right, so ideally, you get your data that just transfers from your embedded devices, goes through the fog, uh, fog cloud computing services, and ends up in the cloud where you can do 
uh, all sorts of things with it. All right, and one of those ways to uh, uh, enable that is something called wireless sensor network. So this is a sort of a, uh, a little bit of a dated slide, but still pretty good from um, the early 2000s when you had wireless sensor networks appearing as, as a new technology. So the idea was is that you could sense the world with these wireless sensors and you could use it um, almost like a microscope or a macroscope as what was uh, proposed. So you put some sensors out there and they could tell you about the world. So if you put them out in a vineyard, maybe they tell you, um, you know, where things are growing, where things are not growing due to humidity, fertilizer, soil motion, all those sorts of uh, parameters. All right, and you had these sort of devices uh, appearing. Uh, so this would be the early 2000s where you had, uh, you know, capable, small and cheap uh, microprocessors uh, starting to appear, your 8-bit uh, microprocessors fairly cheap and it sort of fueled the boom in sensor networks and you could do all sorts of things, environmental sensing, you know, sensing uh, in traffic, you had industrial sensing and of course you were starting to get your human uh, centered computing, how humans can communicate with uh, computing systems. So that started to appear around about the, uh, the early 2000s. All right, there's something known as the Ghana Hype Chart, all right, so this is produced um, every year by and uh, it sort of uh, plots the, uh, the the progress of you know what's what's exciting, what's new technologies, and how they're going. So if you're if you're up here, you've got your innovation trigger on this side there. That means that's new, exciting technology that's come about, and so on. And then of course you go down here, to, you know, peak of expectations. All right, that means the technology has become uh, more mature. You get the uh, the trough of disillusionment. That means the technology has really re you know, reached its uh, its limit, and it's not really going to go further. And then you get the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity, where it's just become you know, mainstream. And you can see quite a few technologies uh, that have been uh, matching that, like virtual realities out there. And right there, um, that's a peer IoT platforms uh, that seem to have seems to have gone up and down on the Ghana hype cycle. It's up again a few years, a few years ago, it disappeared, but it's back now. So that's appeared there. So it's on the, uh, on the way up, the innovation of trigger, and that's due with the, the new types of devices coming out. Now the interesting one there is also the brain computer interface. I think that's a really fascinating space that's, uh, that's coming out. So being able to control things with your mind. All right, so before we get there, uh, we'll go back to wireless sensor networks. So this is effectively what it's about. You get the efficient and uh, cheap uh, microcontrollers and so on that's uh, efficient as in, uh, you know, they give you enough computing power to do stuff uh, while being able to run off, you know, limited power, a couple of watch batteries and so on. Uh, cheap radios was, was an interesting thing. Uh, pretty much the radios you got in the early 2000s were not much better than, you know, controlling your, your garage. Uh, but uh, now you get you know, really sophisticated radios, you get your, your Wi-Fi systems and so on. So, so wireless sensor networks, uh, effectively you can put all these systems together, it takes a little bit more than two dollars to put them together and uh, you can throw them out there uh, in the environment, have them communicate uh, and build services around them, and effectively have them communicate to, uh, to a cloud service and offer that to, to customers. All right, so I did a little bit of work uh, at CSIRO and uh, their main interest was to put these systems out there in the environment, okay, have them sensors, have them on farmland and uh, use them for all sorts of things, you know, being able to monitor climatic conditions and so on. So they deployed this one, I think this deployment here with the solar panel and the weather station up there was in Springbrook National Park and that was with uh, a project with the Queensland Environmental Protection Agency to monitor how um, farmland uh, was regenerating to monitor wildlife and so on with acoustic sensors as well as uh, climatic stations with, with weather stations. And of course they branched out and they did quite a few more other uh, sensor network deployments, you know, putting more stuff in rainforests. This was an interesting one there. They put uh, water sensors out on uh, Lake Wyvernhoe this would have been from 2009 to 2011. 
2011, of course, we had uh, the Great Flood and it washed uh, all the sensors away. So, but uh, the sensors were out there floating around there on buoys and uh, they had temperature sensors and they were, they were used to, to help uh, the environmental uh, scientists build up sort of a model on how the, uh, uh, the water uh, flows in, in Lake Waiho. Of course, there were other deployments there, including uh, trying to track uh, fruit bats for biosecurity reasons, uh, tracking cows, and uh, there was another one that was used to uh, try and track uh, or monitor energy usage uh, within an indoor environment. So lots of interesting things that you can do with uh, these sort of wireless sensor systems. So what's some of the hardware that uh, you've got there? So, so this. I guess is a good history and a good comparison of uh, the types of hardware you can get out there uh, with the sensor networks around about the two, 2007. Uh, you know, you'd get your 8-bit systems there, so, you know, doing a comparison. Effectively, what you had in the late 70s, early 80s, you could now get on a chip, and uh, you could now use that to, to build your system up. So those kinds of systems were very comparable to, to what was known as uh, the flex system, so that sort of flex board the radio on board is very similar to what you would call the, the Arduino today. So a little bit of a history there. Okay, so you can see there, uh, to draw, draw a line there, run about early 2000s up to 2008. Um, you know, CSIRO, they developed their, their own platforms uh, in-house, and these are all your 8-bit platforms. All right, so your 8-bit platforms is very similar to your computing systems, your computers, your PCs that you would have used in the 80s, so you know, run about 20 years ago, uh, or 30 years ago now. Uh, and then later on, uh, so from 2010 onwards, um, you start to see uh, an increase in the uh, capability of the microcontrollers. So now we start to see 16-bit and 32-bit uh, processors being used on these embedded systems. So no longer 8-bits rather 16 and 32 bits, and now we're getting to computing systems that you, uh, you would have used in, or would have been used in the early uh, and mid-1990s. So, so you can see there that um, you know, the capability has, has grown. And now that you get to 16 and 32 bit uh, systems, now you can really get to, to do things with the internet. You know, if you run a TCP IP stack, key things you need, processing power, and memory, and uh, it's pretty hard to do that when uh, you've only got 2K of memory, but now you get these systems that have got 8K, 40K, and so on, 128K of memory. And uh, now you can really start to do some interesting things. All right, and just a snapshot of the kind of platforms um, you can get today, um, a little bit more than, than $2. Uh, $2 is fine if you, you just get the, the chip itself on a board, but you know, with a chip, you need to power it and add some sort of all sorts of other systems. And you can see that there's these various platforms there that you can get, you know, $20, $30, uh, and so on, $40. Uh, this one here, which I find quite interesting, the Electron over there, it actually gives you 2G and 3G um, access, as well as a microcontroller there and some power circuitry on there that's really exciting. So you could actually put a, take that device, write some code on it, uh, add a battery, connect it up to some sensors, put it out somewhere, and you know you can effectively phone home, upload things through th uh, a three through a three G connection to the cloud, and that's really, really exciting. And you've got other ones there. You've got the sensor tag, which I'll show in a minute. You've got your node MCU, which are your Wi-Fi type uh, systems and the photons, and a Zigbee, and which uh, a Zigbee sort of home automation type program. Uh, this is a cool one here. I've got the the sensor tag here. I actually. Uh, use this uh, to teach in my subjects there. It's kind of cool. For $20, you get about 10 different sensors, as well as a 32-bit uh, microcontroller that can uh, use Zigbee and, and Bluetooth 4.0. So you can actually communicate this with, uh, with your smartphones. And you can power it, plug in a battery, and uh, away it goes. So sensor network operating system protocols, what you've got out there. Um, you've got various ones out there, the Tiki, TinyOS, and so on. They're all designed. Uh, to meet key things such as low power, uh, being able to connect to other different types of sensors, and also have different communication stacks. And we've got different types of IDEs. Uh, we've got Embed. Of course, Arduino is pretty popular. They've got lots of other systems out there. Uh, communication protocols, uh, common ones, Zigbee, and you've got Bluetooth, 6-load pad. 
Uh, other ones out there, the nice semiconductor standard, Apple iBeacons, and of course uh, the Google Eddystone. Uh, those protocols are becoming sort of widely used in the home automation space. And uh, another one that's sort of getting a lot of traction now is called LoRaWAN and so on. And this one is really designed for really long uh, range networks, you know, where your range is measured in, in kilometers. And it's interesting to see that a few of the, the telcos out there are actually interested in providing uh, LoRaWAN solutions um, as well as, you know, maybe replacing their machine-to-machine -machine, uh, solutions. But there's all sorts of things out there. And you've got different protocols, MQTT, XMPP, and all sorts of things that you'd find standard cloud services. All right, so that just gives you an overview um, of the different types of platforms and uh, systems out there uh, that you can use. I've only mentioned a few, but they're out there and uh, they're fairly cheap. We haven't reached the $2 mark yet. I mean, those are the, the nice Wi-Fi modules. Once you add power, batteries, and so on, uh, it starts to build up. In fact, I think you, you pay more now for, for batteries than the actual system, particularly if you've got to ship it in from the US it's lithium ion and you know, it comes with big red stickers, don't put it on the passenger plane. Um, right, so I'm just going to go through uh, a whole bunch of uh, different projects um, that I get uh, my students to do in, uh, in one of the subjects that I run uh, in conjunction with CSIRO. So they do a whole bunch of, uh, of interesting things. We give them a, um, a small budget, they buy some platforms. Well, we give them platforms and we give them uh, various types of applications to work on. So this one here uh, was uh, using the what we call the FLIR infrared uh, module. And so effectively it's an infrared camera uh, that you could get. And uh, uh, the project here was to try and measure heart rate. You know, if you could uh, take an infrared image of your face, um, can you tell uh, what your heart rate is, you know, and the implications are maybe you could take, you know, an infrared image of a whole group of people and tell what their heart rates are rather than, you know, putting, you know, um, sensors on the actual person, so, you know, do it non-invasively. So this was using uh, the FLIR Lepton uh, camera, infrared imaging camera uh, that you could get. At the time, it was about $800. That it's a little drop now, $500. So, and so effectively, the this group here, they got a FLIR camera. Uh, they connected up to a Raspberry Pi because they needed to uh, provide a nice interface to it, uh, a web-based interface, so you could see the images and so on. So they connect up to the Raspberry Pi, of course, uh, with another camera, uh, Raspberry Pi camera, so you could uh, contrast and, and see to the, the, the two. And uh, you know that worked quite well. The accuracy was uh, all right. Um, but uh, you could definitely see um, the heart rate uh, from a person. So that was, was quite interesting, quite good with the FLIR Lepton camera. Uh, another project uh, was using something called a LiDAR. So a LiDAR is uh, effectively a laser radar. So instead of using radio waves uh, to try and uh, scan and find obstacles, it would actually use a laser beam uh, to try and do it. And uh, this group tried to uh, use a LiDAR to try and track people uh, in, in an indoor situation. Uh, you know, why not use a camera? In a lot of situations, using a camera requires all sorts of um, ethical clearance and it might not be um, appropriate or suitable to, to use cameras in those cases. So if you can, you know, track people in a different way, um, you know, you could have uh, all sorts of interesting things you, you could do with that. So one way in order to do it was effectively shoot out laser beams, uh, with these uh, LiDAR scanners. LiDARs are actually used for autonomous cars uh, to determine you know, what's around uh, the vehicle. So we sent it and, you know, um, I think this LiDAR here, I think actually comes out of uh, the, one of the robot vacuum cleaners, uh, the cheap ones that you can buy from China. And so we've got the LiDAR there. Uh, they use an ESP8266, uh, so a Wi-Fi module. Um, you can use, they put it together, effectively it built a mount for it, so you've got the Wi-Fi module, sorry, you've got the Wi-Fi module there, you've got the, um, the LiDAR module, it's all on a, uh, on a platform there, it's all on a, on a server, so it will actually move and it will scan. And uh, so from the scanning information, you could pick up the points, you could transmit it 
to, to another system and uh, you could process it offline uh, you know, and uh, you could figure out if effectively what was around it. So you can see here, um, this was, I think this is a milk crate that they put next to it, so it sort of picked up a milk crate on an angle. This one here is interesting, so this is someone standing in front of it, and you can actually see it's picked up uh, the, the, the person's torso and their arms. Stand a little bit closer, and you can start to see some defining features uh, from, uh, from the scans. And uh, you can see here the other scans here, so this is someone sort of moving around. Here's someone moving left to right and around. So you can determine, you know, from that 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 was a person, not uh, something else that was, that was moving. So that was with uh, with the LIDAR. Sort of a more traditional one was uh, something called uh, roadside emissions monitoring. So being able to uh, put some sensors out there along a the road and uh, measure what sort of emissions uh, were being emitted uh, along that stretch of road. So you put, connect a whole bunch of sensors up to, so in this case here, the sensor tag platform, uh, which was used, and then have that communicate back to a uh, base station and then of course, upload that to, uh, to a cloud service. And then you could access that with an app. So there it is. There's the system there. Effectively, there you got the sensor tags there. Since the tag already had sensors such as uh, temperature, humidity, and uh, I think it had infrared temperature as well. And uh, they connected up uh, a gas sensor uh, to it. Uh, interestingly enough, I think that gas sensor is probably three times more than the actual sensor tag. So it's more expensive getting the, the sensors than it was uh, getting the sensor tags. So that connected up there, and then uh, here was another system there. Uh, this one here connected up to a dust sensor. Dust sensor actually, I think in this case here, had a, a different type of interface. So we can connect it up to a sensor tag and needed power. Um, so the dust sensor here was infrared dust sensor, and it would actually sense dust particles. So they put that those uh, two systems together and deployed it along the road somewhere along campus, I think by the tennis court, somewhere uh, to try and get some, some data. And uh, you can see here, they wrote an app to do it. So you can see here, they, they measured some of the, uh, the gas, humidity, pollutants, and so on. And you can scroll back through time. And uh, you can see effectively what was being emitted uh, along that road uh, at that particular time. And uh, you know, an interesting thing about that, once you get that information, maybe you could tell uh, from the road emissions, you know, how, um, how occupied is that? How often are cars driving down that road? You know, rather than you know, putting up uh, physical road cameras uh, on the road. All right. Um, another one um, was this one here. This was one to try and localize, in this case here, your keys. So we attached a, a they attached a, a tag to to a key. It's a Wi-Fi module. And the idea was uh, using the base stations in a in like a densely populated area like UQ, where you've got lots of base stations around. Could you actually try and localize uh, this uh, your keys that has a Wi-Fi module connected uh, to it? And then uh, what was uh, so all that information went up to a server, and it was presented back to the user uh, in a uh, virtual reality uh, setting. Right, so we visualized it with apps and uh, with an augmented reality type type uh, system. All right, so head-mounted system, and um, they use some libraries, Google Cardboard in this case, to, to visualize it. So you can see here, you can see there's the key there. All right, so it's sort of the key somewhere there, over there, uh, wherever it's pointing. So by uh, put mounting the sensors uh, along with, uh, with the headset, uh, using the, in this case, the phone sensors and using the information coming back from, uh, from the, the, the key itself, you could uh, localize it to a reasonable amount of accuracy. Do we have any graphs? No, we don't. All right. So another project that was done uh, a few years ago was to do something called uh, radio tomographic imaging. So what you saw before was trying to track something uh, by putting a device on something. Well, you know, that's a bit cumbersome. Uh, you've got to put a device on something. Can you track something without putting a device on something and using something 
uh, inexpensive. And one way to do that was to use radio tomographic imaging. So basically, if you have a, a whole bunch of radio transmitters surrounding an area, and you put a, an obstacle or a person in it, uh, that obstacle or person will obstruct the radio waves going through it, and you could measure that difference because uh, humans are just really bags of water, so it attenuates the radio waves. And then from that, you can try and determine if someone is in a particular uh, part of that zone. So you can see a test area there. Just put some, uh, uh, it wasn't these ones, it was those, uh, those radio modes uh, around the place. And then by using uh, the signal strength between a receiver and transmitter pair, you can try and determine uh, if someone was, uh, was within the zone. And uh, you can see there, here's someone trying to move from left to right. And so on, and the moving around where you see the big red one is the big uh, sort of obstacle picked up, you know, there's the, the biggest amount of attenuation there. So, so that's trying to use, you know, information uh, in a different way. You know, rather than putting something on someone, see if you can use what you have out there in, in the environment and, and uh, get some information from it. All right. So another system was, uh, sort of a traditional system there, was to put some accelerometers uh, on a pouch and then put that on a diver and then try and uh, use that for trying to coach uh, divers, because divers have to turn at appropriate uh, points when they're jumping off uh, the diving board and have some vibration tactile sensors. So there was a lot of uh, challenges in doing that. You know, we built in a wireless charging device. So if you wanted to charge this, you actually put it onto the mat and it wirelessly charged and so on. And uh, it was all controlled uh, through an app, so it had a Bluetooth interface uh, to it. And uh, the last one there was uh, with the mind wave one. And so I, I think this one was, was quite interesting. Unfortunately, I think our group got uh, too far with this one, but I've got another group working on it. Uh, effectively trying to control things uh, with your mind. So you put this uh, headset on and uh, you can measure uh, your EEG, so effectively your brain waves, and determine things such as, you know, are you concentrating or, or what's your concentration level? Or are you meditating? and all sorts of parameters and how you respond to stimuli. So if you see some red flashing light, um, how can you respond uh, to that? Can you do some sort of action? So I think that's actually really exciting. And that's, you know, I guess the ultimate interface of the Internet of Things is to take your brain and plug it into, uh, into the Internet. All right. Do we have any time for questions? Yes. Ah, yes. So what you really need to do is you really need to combine that with a neural network and you need to train it uh, over time in order to get um, some accurate results. And also, if you do things like provide stimuli, so if you provide, uh, like with uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, how he controls things is that um, the commands actually flash up on the screen, and then once he sees it, he sort of concentrates and you know, and then it, it assumes that that's the command. So if you can design your system, you know, like that, then um, something like this is uh, can work quite effectively. But you need to combine it with a few other things. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. They have, um, the, this one here is the, is the cheap one, um, but you can get ones that have more electrodes. This one only has like two or three electrodes, but you get one that effectively covers your head, and that gives you, uh, I guess, more resolution for different types of actions you can do. Okay, so that's all the time we've got. Um, can everyone thank Matt for his time? Sorry, Matt.